briefly some WebRTC stats and WebRTC PC. And as usual, we'll uh, do updates on various drafts following a meeting based on what we decide. Okay, so uh, hopefully everyone has links to the latest drafts of everything. If you're here, you probably had the meeting info. Um, we do need a scribe. Do we have a volunteer? I, I think I don't have much to say, so I could describe. Okay. You make some notes. I'll be turned on recording. Uh, yes. yes. Hello. Okay. All right, and uh, there is a link to these slides on the Working Group Wiki, which you might want to follow along because there are links and stuff you could bring up. All right. For today, uh, here's the agenda. Uh, we're going to initially talk about content hints, uh, and we have with us some uh, video coding experts, Thomas Dade and Mo Zanetti. Hopefully, it's always on at some point. Uh, then we'll talk about media capture screen share issues, uh, and then a little bit of a report on dead statistics from Harold, and then a few web RTC issues, which hopefully we can clear up. All right, so first about the charter. Uh, as many of you know, the current charter expires in March, and we have had a draft charter out, which extends the working group to, uh, actually that should be 2020, because extending it to March 31st wouldn't help much. Uh, and we've made some changes based on feedback from the last virtual interim. Uh, we added a discussion of data uh, channel, including accessing the data in media, sorry, transferring data between peers, as well as access to raw data, which is accessing the data in media streams. So those two things were added in terms of API functions. In terms of normative specs, we removed links to the WebRTC ICE and WebRTC Quick Specs, but added a general discussion of data transfer functions, and that included uh, various interfaces for the data transfer of data, and that included message-based as well as stream-based communications uh, and the ability to consider various API changes uh, for use of more than one data transfer to support uh, the data transfer functions. So we also updated external organizations referencing the art area of ITF. Uh, so it's more than just RTC web, because that includes MMusic, ABT, EXT, um, and we also mentioned quick working groups which probably should not be in the art area, uh, but more in the transport area. Um, and we also added the, a link to the transport area for TSV WG. Maybe we ought to move quick there as well. Uh, and then we also have a link to the what working group, which uh, possibly the RTC APIs could reference fetch streams and other specs from what working group. And lastly, we added a timeline. So uh, basically, uh, I, I guess we're claiming that we're going to reach PR for media capture in Q4 2018 uh, and recommendation in Q1 2019. For WebRTC, we'll update the CR in Q2 2018 uh, and PR in Q4. Wow. Uh, recommendation in Q1 2019, and then getting started on the object-oriented APIs. So that's where we are with the charter. We've incorporated, I guess, all the comments we've gotten so far, but wanted to solicit additional feedback here to make sure that we haven't missed anything. Um, so what do people think? Colin, do you have an opinion? Yeah, so I mean, I, I'd gone through that and I, I, I thought like a lot of things that were really important to me about like how we were going to build on top of and bring in the object model and stuff were all really clear and, and the specs in the charter, so I liked it. Um, one thing that's not a charter issue, but I would sort of like to see us do is let's have, maybe it'd be nice to have some sort of face-to-face -face get together type meeting 
um, where we could really dig in, you know, spend at least half a day really digging into proposals on how we move forward with the new stuff and what, what new work we should do going forward. But I don't think any, I think that's after chartering, and I don't think it changes the charter. Mm -hmm. But something presumably before TPAC. Yeah, TPAC seems way too far out. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking, you know, after ITF and, be, and before summer. <laughs> something soon. Okay. okay. <laughs> Any other comments? Okay, I guess the plan is to, if we don't hear any more comments, uh, to send this off to the AC, right, Dom? I think Dom is not here, but that's the, 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 the plan. And the optimistic plan is to get it out by March 1st. Dom has already circulated this uh, proposal with the W3C management and incorporated some comments from them. And they, so he's pretty optimistic we can meet this deadline. And then it would be to, for the AC re review for four weeks. So we could get done before the end of March. Oh, okay. All right. So if we've gotten all the feedback we can from this meeting, I think we'll move on. All right, so next item on the agenda is content hints. Uh, and we have brought uh, for your edification, Thomas and Mo, who are codec experts, video coding experts, to try to help us sort through some of the content hint issues. So before I turn it over to them, just want to briefly give you a little, one more, yet more reminder. Um, so in WebRTC 1.0, we have something called degradation preference, which is an enum that's input to the video encoder, uh, and it includes directives to maintain resolution, maintain frame rate, or balanced. But the question has come up, what about other things like audio and APIs other than WebRTC, which don't have an equivalent of degradation preference? Uh, and so the idea advanced by Peter was to have a content hint as a media stream track property, so that would enable usage by other APIs like media stream recorder and other APIs with less flexible controls. Um, and also potentially, I guess the content hint could inform balanced if you didn't put uh, maintain frame rate or maintain resolution. And there's a demo uh, up on GitHub that shows you the difference it can make. Similarly, a little uh, description of above about how what difference it makes in text. And some of the examples of the hint were motion, detail, speech, and music. So, Thomas and Mo, all sure. yours. Um, so basically, to summarize the types of events we can do, um, there are basically two categories. Uh, one is rate control hints, um, which is what the current proposal has in it, uh, the motion versus quality hint. Um, and then there's also uh, encoder and format specific feature hints that will tell you something usually about the content, like I have text or I have um, you know, a, a webcam or something like that. Um, and so those two things are not in the solution um, as it's currently proposed. So on the next slide, I have the, the visual hint. Um, so their video rate control hint basically is for people who aren't aren't already familiar with it, the idea is that we have a trade-off um, when we run out of bits, um, and we have, you know, for example, you flip between slides or you have a sudden scene change, you're going to use a ton of bits, um, and you may not be able to do that due to your rate control parameters. Um, so you have two choices. One is you set, you uh, send the frame at very low quality because that's all you can afford, and you, you basically have this pulse as the the video quality drops immensely and increases. Um, or you have the option of dropping the frame entirely and sending the uh, uh, using those bits towards the future frame, um, which you know avoids this drop in quality. But the whole you know the whole video freezes for a frame as you drop a frame, basically. And so there are different applications, like for example, PowerPoint maybe preferred the drop frame style, um, whereas what you know streaming a video game, you may not want to have random pauses in it. Um, so the next slide, uh, I can summarize the other types. Uh, 
uh, I guess this is how I have to put the slide in. Uh, so the implementation of this is uh, different between OpenH.264 and libvpx. Um, in the current code that implements the, the contents. Um, so the, the libvpx one is very simple. They, they basically turn off features that would allow the encoder to use a lower quality frame, so it's more likely to skip. Um, the open h 64 one is a little bit more complicated. It also adjusts frame skipping. Um, it adjusts a couple other parameters too that are uh, uh, like that also basically effectively control the same thing. Um, there's nothing really content specific in there. Um, the next slide uh, has a quick summary of some of the encoder only features that we can do. Um, the proposal currently, I, I kind, of, kind of wanted to list these, and it's explicitly things that we're not hinting. Um, one is uh, the ability to, like, there's, the newer codecs can actually copy text across the frame, so you can uh, encode repetitive text and patterns very well. Um, it it's, it's, has a huge number of downsides when you enable that feature, so you can imagine it's posting as a hint, um, but if you hint wrong here, you're going to destroy the quality of your video, so it's a uh, very... Uh, uh, it, it's kind of a thing to easily get wrong on the user side. Uh, and likewise, there's something that's, uh, you, could, you could hint the type of content, like, you know, text-like or image-like, and maybe the viewer distance, and that lets you choose some things like perceptual optimization and quantization. Um, it's, it's, you know, getting this wrong isn't so bad, um, but also it's something that the encoder can choose smartly by itself. Um, so the benefit is rather small, and it's also very codec-specific. Uh, very encoder implementation specific. Um, so these are not part of the proposal. Yeah, so I guess you're saying, Thomas, that if you, just because you select something like detail doesn't mean you would turn on intra-block copy. Correct. Right. Like de detail, detail does not mean screencast. Right. So we're trying to come to a decision on what to do about all of this. Uh, and the kind of, decisions we could make is we could say it's out of the scope of the working group, we'll ignore it. The proposed solution, namely the content hits is good, or we want some other solution or combination of solutions. Yeah, I've discussed this um, a fair bit, uh, I believe, with people in the, in the, uh, in the past, because mm -hmm. um, uh, this has come up, you know, came up last year. I believe originally, um, and um, overall, I'm generally positive about the idea of providing some hints. Um, there are some questions to resolve, particularly as to where the hints would live and how you would specify them, uh, whether they would be part of media stream tracks, which I believe is the current proposal on the table from people or whether or not they would be uh, something that is a property of the sinks that is directly controlled by the application, okay? Uh, particularly this, um, there, you know, some of the issues involve like what happens when, when data gets transformed through say web audio or other things that, that, that uh, transform it or recreate streams from previous content, et cetera. Do these, do these carry across? Do you have to patch across it by hand? All these sorts of things. Um, you, it's certainly possible to put this as an application, put this, attach this to a stream or whatever, if you want, yeah, and then have code that looks at the stream and decides whether what to do with it. So you can do that. You, you can attach it to the stream without that being part of the spec um, as an application. Um, um, so I'm generally, to summarize, I'm generally positive about the idea. I my inclination is to have this be a property of the sinks rather than the, the streams, um, which may affect where it gets specified. But if it's about encoding, how can it be part of the sinks as opposed to part of the sources? Well, the the encoder is a sink for data. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's a sink for a media stream. Okay, the media stream stuff goes in somewhere and you do something with it. So that that's that's where that, so that would occur there. Uh, the second question about this would be uh, how you define what sort of things you tag stuff with 
you know, what is a list of tags? How does this get, what happens if we have new tags we want to add? How does this map to what things do? To a certain extent, this is the, the, the job of the particular sync to decide what to do with it, okay? Which is another reason why I was thinking putting it on the sync made some sense. So oh. I know there's some al alternative arguments, so I'll stop talking for now. Uh, so I had a, one comment similar to Randall's uh, in that if this is a property of, I'm, I'm wondering if there's a precedent in the web platform for this, because this, at the end of the day, this really is a control surface and people are going to set these things and expecting certain behaviors. So uh, it seems um, it's a level of generality here that I'm not sure is good because we're kind of saying that um, all sinks will want to set the same settings for these things. Well, <clears throat> so I'd like, uh, Thomas, can you uh, <clears throat> explain to us your recommendation? Yeah, we also have Carlin on the queue, be oh, okay. info, Bernard. Uh, um, my, my recommendation is, you know, basically the, the only hint you'd want to use here would be the right control hint. Um, and it would be ideal to not, I know there's already a very similar kind of hint with degradation preference. It would be very nice to only have one of those two, um, or, you know, worst case, have them have identical language. So are you saying, Thomas, that you don't think we need to control things like intra-block copy? Um, not right now. I think uh, part of the problem is that those are all things that can, you know, a sufficiently smart encoder can, can make the decision. Um, and uh, a lot of those features are so new that we don't know if a encoder can do it or not. Um, but certainly specifying the content hint when the encoder can choose it automatically would be a mistake. So I don't think it's really wise to specify those hints right now. So I think other people in the queue, I'll wait. I, I, I can't Tom, see so, the queue, uh, so can you manage it, Stefan? It's Cullen here. Um, so I, I think that we need, I, I mean, I, the, the idea that the codex just figure it out itself for particularly the screen share cont, uh, case has not worked well for us in the past. So I think I, I do want some way to at least have at least a minimal type of hint to indicate uh, some information that is useful to the encoder. Um, where we attach that, I don't really care. I don't think, I, I mean, it's all sort of bike shedding, like we can get at the right spot, how general it is, doesn't really care. What I don't want to see is all the different browsers have different ways to do it. That would be really bad. So I'd like to see us, you know, specify something and it be well enough defined that application developers know what they need to do to um, be able to get the different behaviors. And since no one's jumping in, I'll, I'll say, yeah, I mean, I mostly agree with Colin there. Um, we can decide where to put it and we can make it work either way. Um, you know, these dis descriptions are something that the codex can totally ignore if they want, uh, or they can take, or they can take advantage of, um, the, you know, they're meant to describe the content, not tell the codec, you must do X as best I can tell. I'm fine with all of that, that, that I'm totally on that page. You know, there's only two browsers and there's only one codec they're going to use that I care about, you know, I mean, I like, you know, and we're just talking about taking the bits from one place and feeding them in. So I think this will, I, I, I think that all sounds good. I agree with you that like, yes, this is not a, yeah. not a command of what's happening. This right. is information about what's coming in that might be useful to the codec. So, yeah. Again, I wonder if there's a precedent in the web platform for that because it makes it hard to write web platform tests for this. If there's no norm, like, I guess, what are implementers being asked to do with this hint in a normative way? I would assume this is implementation defined what you do with the hint. Uh, the fact, the only uh, web platform test I would suggest that would be appropriate with this is to guarantee it gets passed where it's supposed to be passed. Well, see, uh, then I think I would much, much rather prefer a sync control like degradation preference where you can actually write a test and have uh, consistent behavior across browsers. The degradation tests really have, have consistent on, on different codecs and different browsers. It's, again, I think it's, it's really a preference. 
Let's, let's just back this up here. If the Kodak takes all the video and codes it to complete black, our web tests all still pass. That's not part of what we test. So yeah, I'm not real worried okay. about like what they right. do with this. Yeah. Um, so, Harald, you're next in the queue. Go. Yeah, so uh, uh, we do have web platform tests that will not that will actually fail if you do that. Just uh, just, uh, just on the pre previous point, but uh, just barely. Uh, the the thing about uh, hints is that it uh, it uh, means that we prefer that you 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 bias things in some direction, but it's not the command and. As Cullen said, guessing at this kind of thing has proven very difficult in the past and may actually be theoretically impossible. Mm. So to Jan Ivar, I think uh, that uh, there has to be some place in the web platform for quality of implementation. There is a lot of things that where quality of implementation mean shouldn't be, but uh, this may be one place where it should be. And uh, I'm of a school that says that giving the platform more information about the content is better than uh, is more more future proof than uh, giving the application writer uh, lots of tools to shoot himself in the foot with. So that's why I, I, I like this idea of a hint. And since I think of it as information about the content, I like to put it on the media, on the media stream track rather than on the on the encoder because it's not information about the encoder; it's inf information about the content. But right. that's my. But I guess I would love if there was a precedent in the platform because we we've gotten into this problem a little bit before in this working group with uh, constraints, for instance, where. Constraints were external. We externalized all requirements onto the application to give implementations free breathing room to change devices whichever way they wanted within the envelope of all constraints. Now, but when push comes to shove, what we end up caring about in the end is consistent defaults across browsers, and that becomes impossible. So that's one example. Well, it's maybe what you care, care about, but I don't think that this is universal at all. Uh, for a, an example of the same thing in our own context, consider echo cancellation. We do not specify echo cancellation algorithm and we do not specify echo cancellation quality. Each browser does it by itself. Well, we actually run the same code in the right. case. But, uh, but, it's but it is possible, possible to write a test. test. It's difficult, but it's possible to write a platform test for echo cancellation. Yeah. Right. Have you tried? Uh, it's on our plan, and it's quite difficult. So, but we we in, we hope to uh, achieve that. You would have to basically have a pre-coded file uh, of audio, and run it through the algorithm uh, with the flag set or not set. And there's some implementations you might be able to detect that it effectively works as a low-pass filter on most implementations. So it's, I, I, it's but, not, but, but it's but, still a testable control surface. That people want to expect, people expect a behavior from their controls. Yes. So we so we we could have tests that uh, for for this this hint too that that it pushes some me video metric in in the direction that is expected. Yes. But uh, I don't think it. I don't think we could, we can uh, usefully oh, constrain, oh, especially when we. We keep on introducing new codecs. So uh, Varun is on the queue, I think, and then Adam and Randall again. Yeah, I just wanted to echo the points that have been made before by Cullen and a few others that uh, this is a really useful uh, hint. And uh, like Harold, I would prefer it would be on the track and not on the encoder, presumably because uh, you want to control not the source but whatever happens after that and uh, to the point that Yanni Var was making about the testing it I think a similar test to what he was suggesting for the 
audio echo cancellation thing can be made here because you could uh, for the four cases of the rate control hint, you could create sequences which would uh, be like moving the the video bit rate or frame rate or frame size in a particular direction that you could see correlation or decorrelation or no correlation with. Um, so my point would be that we've, I think we discussed this I think at the interim in in San Francisco and it seemed like a decent idea at that time and it's come back again and we've seen issues with this in the past as well so I think we should at least discuss the, a solution for it. Right so Varun, would you then expect browsers to to have to pass this test? Yeah like in, a, in some form I think. So it's not uh, just a hint then it's a normative requirement? like the hint would require the browser to do something with it like what it does might be within a range of possibilities and we could test for what it does within that range it sounds like more than a hint i think uh, the hint is more like i think it is a hint in the sense that browsers or codecs have sufficient leeway on addressing it in suitable ways not exactly the same way Okay, Adam is next. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, we talked about this in, in San Francisco as well. Are we, is this something, if we put this on the track, is this something that uh, kind of duplicates what you can do with constraints already? I remember we had that discussion, but I, I don't remember yeah, wait, the, the answer conclusion. Is no. It, it doesn't, doesn't duplicate constraints. Uh, not for the video case, at least it doesn't duplicate constraints. For audio, it does for echo cancellation. So the only thing would be, yeah, the the, the audio hints would actually just enable or should, can you see that in the, in the constraints settings then or but perhaps that were. I, I, can you see? Can you see the result of this by checking constraint settings? Or? Well, I, I think we talked about this before, and for audio, I think we landed on that content hint was the the default default if there are no constraints. But the, any, if you have constraints, then those override content hints. Is what I remember discussing. If we're going to implement this, I think that's how we would handle it. And for what is the what is the new thing for video that's not doable with constraints? Just to my information. It doesn't, I don't think for video it influences what mm -hmm. comes out of media capture at all. Well, but it's downstream. So there is some overlap because uh, we're just going to discuss later constraints for screen sharing, for instance. So if I, if I share my uh, 200, uh, you know, 2880 times 1800, uh, 60 frames per second desktop, uh, I'm going to want to use constraints to, to make that palatable to a, a peer connection. And I'm going to lower the frame rate. And if I if I don't want to do video instead, I might downscale it and have a high frame rate. So there's definitely uh, overlap there, I think. Well, but but um, yeah, Nivar, uh, despite you you might do all of that, but how does that? I mean, would it you wouldn't do it differently depending on whether you had, you know, detail or motion? Which well, I think it's screen capture, but inherently is detail. Unless you're doing some kind of video. Well, uh, no, I, I think that. the point was it isn't because it depends what you're capturing, right? A game would be motion and a PowerPoint presentation would be detail. So I think it isn't inherently. But, it, 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 but you could, it's a control surface that you can use to, yeah. to for both games and for uh, whatever's on your screen that is usually detail. So what, what are the what kind of interactions of these things? So what does that have to do with, with, uh, with height and frame rate? So one of the entirely orthogonal to both of us. So one of the points I was going to make um, when I came up on the list was that um, inherently, I think if these are going to be hints, these are you're describing various properties of the data, um, as opposed to twitting controls on a uh, directly on a codec. Um, and if you're describing properties of the data. Data can have more than one property. Um, so, for example, 
as something could be a screen share but not and be detailed but or be a screen share but not be detailed etc so i think anything like this would need to be able to support a list of properties that describe it okay and then the codec can you, you the, the sync which would typically be a codec but not always like web web audio is a sync for example um uh the, can take it can look at those or not as it sees fit uh, that's one something I disagree with Varun about is that this is not these are like I said these are hints that describe the data and which could be useful to a particular codec or might not be a codec might you could in well, I'm, you know, I'm making a straw man but you could have a codec that where whereby it had no way to do something that like uh, change the resolution or change the frame rate um, and if so it would happily ignore the hint or an imp implementation might ignore it. That's fine. Okay, you're trying to help things as opposed to directly control. If you want to directly control, those should be put on directly on the uh, RTP sender or whatever whatever control for the codec you want to have as a direct control. So, I think what you just said. Tim also uh, addresses the interblock copy thing because you might want to have something be both text and detail uh, at the same time. Oh, uh, this is Mo. Can I just put in my recommendation? Sorry, I didn't get a chance to put it. Sorry. In. Go ahead, Mo. <laughs> Sorry. I, I didn't. Uh, I I didn't really have a recommendation at the time of the slides because uh, I had to think about it a little bit more, and I think I flipped my position. Originally, I was supportive of the hint. I thought that it would help. And the reason why I thought it would help was because we actually do provide a hint today in a lot of common systems. Um, when we know that the content is synthetic, uh, we, we provide a screen hint to the encoder. So the encoder can make a better decision at runtime. Now, to summarize the thread that we had, <clears throat> in a perfect world, you wouldn't need any kind of hint at all. The encoder would be smart enough to dynamically adjust to any content. It wouldn't need to know whether this is a screen share or this is um, a, you know, a natural video, uh, it could dynamically adjust and give you very sharp detail when there's not much motion and very good motion when there is motion and sacrificing a little bit on the, on the quantization. So in a perfect world, no encoder would need this, but encoders are not that sophisticated yet. So these hints are often given in, in practical systems. What, uh, what I'm afraid about here is that um, I think here we're talking about giving an application, which really may have very little knowledge of, of the content, giving an application an ability to override what the browser thinks is the best mode of operation. Um, so I was confused before. I thought that we were talking about maybe internal APIs so that the browser can make sure that the encoders for this track uh, use, the, use the optimal settings. Um, that that I think is separate from what we're talking about here. Here we're talking about an application override that if the browser gets it wrong, the browser says, I think it's a screen share because you, you, you called, you know, you know uh, get screen capture, not get you know, media capture. And so, and so the browser made a guess that this is screen content, but it's actually not good for screen content settings of a typical encoder. You actually wanna use video content settings because you're sharing a game or something like that. I think that's a separate question and that override parameter is a very, very minute use case. And if you put this API out there, I think you're going to have a lot of applications that are confused about thinking that they need to set it. And then, the you know, in, in the common cases, they're going to set it wrong. Um, and you're going to have a, a worse user experience than you intended. Yeah. So I think we need to be very careful about whatever we provide. It has to be very clear that this is an override of a browser option that should be, you know, 99% never touched. Yeah. A, a counter example. Um, uh, might be uh, when you're recording, when you're uh, sending audio, uh, whether it's vo uh, spoken voice or whether it's music. Uh, you as the, uh, the browser does not know, know that. It would take quite a bit of signal processing to try to guess that, and it still could be wrong as, because the, it could be that the music just happens to be in the background, but you're actually caring about spoken word in this particular application. Um, the, uh, uh, so, I do think there is a, a reason for having this, uh, and um, I agree that there, it's not a perfect world. The, the codecs and so forth can't know this for sure, and the browser can't know this for sure, even if it knows the source. 
and it doesn't necessarily know that the like you said if if something is setting up a, a share of a game uh yes you're right it would have it, it best if it knows that it's a game and not a slideshow okay um and that in th that could you know these could allow for that uh, a generic application that doesn't know what it's sharing would have to make a best guess as to what it's likely to be it's sharing the screen it doesn't know what's whether it's a slideshow or a game or whatever it would just say it's a screen share and things would come from there um, a smart application might give you a way to say I'm sharing a screen, but it's all, but I, but I, but it, but it's displaying video. Uh, I expect it to be displaying video content because it's for for games, or have a twiddle for the user to change it. I agree. There's no perfect solution here. I think this is better than having no solution. However, but uh, let me let me get back to uh, whether or not this has overlap with constraints. Originally, I argued that it doesn't. That this is a hint, not a constraint. But now thinking more deeply, I think you could accomplish the exact same thing for the video case for the motion detail with the frame rate constraint. You could set a min frame rate constraint of one frame per second for a screen share, and the browser should honor that and, and go down to a pretty low frame rate if necessary. You could set a, a min frame rate of 30 if you, if you absolutely want motion. Um, and that would accomplish, I think, the same thing as the motion detail setting and obviate the need for the degradation preference as well. So I think there probably are too many knobs that applications can can probably get wrong and not fully understand the interaction between them. Maybe we already have the right knob. We just need to make sure that we guide users to always use this particular knob for this use case and make sure browser implementations yeah. are actually honoring that knob. I think a lot of them ignore a lot of the constraints or don't do them right. I, I would actually make the point that perhaps, and it's worth considering, and we don't have to do it right here, um, that, that uh, hints like this are actually a better a better solution than the current complex constraint language that often uh, causes uh, applications to get to get surprising results when they try to do anything more than generic well, um, yeah I, I think the more important thing here is we don't want like surprising results I think are okay as long as they're consistent across browsers if we get surprising results that aren't consistent is the real danger um, also, just I, I, I uh, one thing is that, that I, I don't want to pick on your example, but the speech versus music example is probably not a very good example because Opus actually has a neural network based speech music detector that's extremely accurate. And if we provided, uh, like that would be an example of something that if the browser provided, if we added a hint and I was an implementer, I would actually want to ignore the hint because I would trust the, the neural network actually far more than the user hint. Um, okay, well, that's a great example. Well, I've been on the queue for a while. So, Carlin is on the queue, and then Harald. So, I mean, the, the, the Opus neural net detector fails miserably in many cases. So, um, I think that's a great example of why automating this is very difficult. Um, so, I, I think we do need this. Uh, no one has to use it. It has to be well documented what it means, and that perhaps it's an override, and then it might be very unwise to use it. But if we have that information, we should just pass it on. It's not a lot of work. We're just talking about passing on this bit that allows an override. And so where we attach it, um, I found Harold's arguments about where to put it pretty compelling. So I, I, I think that, that that sounded like the, the right answer to me. I, I'm not sure I've heard too many people speak against that. It seemed like a, a reasonably good thing. So, I mean, if people have strong reasons why we shouldn't do that, then I'd be quite, let's hear them. But otherwise, it seems like that's a pretty concrete proposal that we could go with. So, Harald? So, the concrete use case that uh, led to this being proposed was actually uh, trying to do automated hinting and getting it wrong. Because we had screen share coming in off, a, off uh, an HDMI cable, which uh, the browser did not expect. So, so the point is that sometimes the application knows better than the browser can detect. That's all. But the, okay, so I actually. Uh, from hearing from Mo and others now, I think this is a racking up uh, a number of arguments for why this is a terrible API. Because uh, A, it, it's not normatively 
enforceable and testable. Uh, it's not on the object that you might uh, expect a behavior from. It's on the source, it's descriptive. It's not mandatory. And uh, you also can risk losing it if, because tracks can be cloned and copied and moved around. You have to make sure to, uh, to copy the hint along and you have to do that in spite of the fact that browsers, you might not see a difference on some browsers. So there's a lot of chances for error here. And also I think it, we call it a hint, but that assumes that a browser is smart enough to know when to ignore the hint. And uh, that's not really true. I think Moore's right is more like a browser override. And the app is saying, trust us, this is speech or trust us, this is motion. And the browser is just going to go, all right. And I, I also redundancy, that's my last point. Like we already have controls for echo cancellation, noise suppression, auto gain control, uh, frame rate and resolution. So uh, why does this working group need this? And so to me, this seems out of scope at least for this working group. I'm not sure where I am on the two, but let me just respond to a couple of those of like um, all those other things that you mentioned that we already have are very similar things, but they don't do this. And they're they're exactly the same as this. The same reasons we needed them as the reason we need this. And browsers, as you know, people have brought very concrete use cases over and over again of why it's impossible for a browser to automatically detect this correctly all the time. You get it some of the time, but not all the time. And that those use cases are ones where it, it does the wrong thing. Now, the reason it's a hint, there are codecs. For example, uncompressed video, where obviously this hint makes no sense. When you're doing uncompressed video as your codec, you can't, this, there's nothing to do with this. So, and it's also all of the codecs are quality of implementation. We have no normative specifications for how the quality of the codecs works or anything. All it is is you can do something with the bitstream. This is an input into that unspecified procedure, just like everything else is unspecified with video. Um, I, you know, and so I, I'm not, I, I'm not seeing a strong argument. I, I'm not understanding deeply why you think we shouldn't have this. That's that's what I'm not getting. I think I just gave a long list. <laughs> I mean, it's redundant. It's well, let's, go test. List. It's let's go through the list point by point again. Then let's let's go through it each one of them and walk me through it and help me understand. Well, a it's not testable. No, it is testable. It's just as testable as echo cancellation. We can compute S and R's of the images and see if they went up or down. It'll be specified as if you do a motion thing, you get better or crisper or less detail or faster changes. Mm -hmm. And we would say it was greater than or equal to zero type change so that it was, um, you know, if you didn't do anything, it was still no. we're within the test parameter range. So it's testable. Next. That, that's, that assumes that it's normative. And then it's not a hint. It, it, no, it, 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 is, it is normative in that this information must be passed to the codec, and the codec may use it in deciding what it will do. That is how it is normative. And that I'm not going to debate with you the word hint or not hint. It, it's just like echo cancellation and many of these other things. And it is testable. It is also highly redundant in that we already have a lot of constraints already. I mean, in fact, if okay. we could get rid of constraints, that would be all for this. Tell me which constraints this is redundant with. And I, I'm not arguing about whether this should be put in, in constraints or not in constraints. I'm not saying where it should be done. But tell uh, me what, how do I, why is this redundant? Prove that to me. Well, it, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm saying it's highly redundant. So we have already echo cancellation, auto gain control, noise suppression for audio. So echo and cancellation, it, if I said echo cancellation, you're saying that that tells it whether I'm capturing from a game or a PowerPoint slide. I mean, that's, that's just not true. That's ridiculous. So how is this redundant? I mean, I agree, it's similar to echo cancellation, but it's not redundant with echo cancellation. Yeah. Yeah. I think I may have lost you if you're talking right now. Anyone here? 
Alan, I can hear you. So okay, one I can't that is... see you on a bar any. Oh no, you're still there. I don't know. So, so I think we had gone over highly redundant. And uh, what's what's next, for us? Hey, Harold, it's Stefan. Can one of you guys talk just to check we can hear you? Uh, yes, I can hear you well. I can, I can hear Colin. I cannot hear Aniva. So it looks like Randall says he's been talking and we haven't been able to hear him. So I suspect we're having a problem here. Um, and we'll get, hopefully those guys will get back in. Hi, uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can. Thank you. Sorry, uh, I don't know what happened there. Um, <clears throat> I'm using WebRTC though. Uh, so, uh, my question to Colin last was: uh, Are you saying that content hint would not affect echo cancellation, auto gain control, or noise suppression? No, I don't think so. Okay. So that that wasn't how I took it. Um, no. Yeah, I think I think some of these. Um, might, if you didn't specify it in a constraint, uh, af affect them. For example, if you said it was music, okay, um, uh, perhaps it would it, it wouldn't it would affect uh, echo cancellation by default if you did not constrain it. Well, then it would affect it, and then it's then there's overlap, oh. right? Oh, okay, so we, they said the constraints were. But the Anavar, I think we're getting. I think we're getting at yeah. the essence of my confusion, and I'm glad we went through this step by step. So you're thinking about the, the content thinking like music and stuff, and I was thinking about the ones of sort of game versus PowerPoint slides of that particular detail motion thing for video. So well, let's go I think to video. I understand then. where you were saying redundant. Well, let, let's go to video then. Let's go for uh, frame rate and resolution and downscaling. Are, are you saying content hint would not affect those? No, those yeah, those are those are separate from it. When you're coding the video, you know, if it's 10 frames per second, you still have to make a choice about whether you favor motion or detail encoding. So I, I think it's the, the the frame rate doesn't tell you which of these two things to do. Well, maybe what this highlights, and maybe we're missing some control surface on on uh, on syncs and codecs. It sounds like so. Could oh, we, you can you well, can add um you can add a million control surfaces to the to the codec interfaces. Um, and give the application a ton of control. This brings up what was described before, which is if um, applications trying to control the codex at that level frequently will have problems doing so correctly. Whereas if you tell the system, you know, this is the type of content you're dealing with, um, the, that can be, uh, you know, you know, the default for that can be encoding the browser. You can have both hints and direct controls. And I get no problem if someone has an argument for a direct control being important, like controlling the maximum frame rate or whatever, that being there. But they are, two, they are fundamentally two different things. One is basically information that helps the codec make decisions when it has options, okay? Um, and, and the other is a thou shalt do this type of request um, that in, assumes that, that, that 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 the app that uh, something knows better than the codec can figure out. I think the big. I mean, I'm generally in favor of this. I think there's some details to work out as to exactly what hints you give and so forth. I think that one of the bigger questions would be whether it goes on the tracks, which involves a lot of making sure it gets copied over and when things get transformed by web audio and so forth, that the right things happen or and or that the applications know they have to do it. Or whether it goes on the on the sinks themselves, which is my preference, but that's something that can be discussed over and decided. Um, I think the general idea of having it is a good one. I think that was much better put than I did. I, I, I agree that makes sense, and I don't feel strongly about where it is. Well, part of the argument I heard about putting it on track was that it would automatically apply to multiple syncs. 
Right. Didn't hear a good argument for well, why we thought that the same control would be the right thing for every, for, for instance, media recorder versus peer connection, that they would have the same requirements about. Um, they would all they would all get the hints as, as you, you could provide the hints to all of them, uh, and an application if it wants to can effectively put it on the track just by adding the property to the track and doing whatever needed, and then at each sync it could it can just look at, at the track and copy whatever is there over to the to the sync's control or you know sync's uh, you know set hint whatever okay. Um, so that so I see the, I see putting it on the sinks as a superset of putting it on the tracks. Um, uh, I'd like to raise one thing. Uh, the, I think that for the video case, the main thing we're talking about, main use case, is is a game versus a normal screen share, right? That's what the issue itself raises, is that the settings for screen content were poor for streaming a game. Um, so why couldn't the app just specify a minimum frame rate in that case, a minimum frame rate 20 or 30? Why would that not solve the issue for, for that specific use case? Constraints well, which, which minimum frame, frame rate do you want? What do you want the minimum frame rate to be? What does the user, if the user thinks that the game Fine. is fluid at, at minimum 20 or 30, then the application could specify minimum well, 20 or 30. That's just not honored today. That's the problem, or that leads to bad behavior. That's not really what the intent is. Well, if you specify a minimum frame rate, um, then what happens if if you can only capture at half that frame rate? Okay. Constraint. Then you have to adjust other parameters. You cannot. You, if you can't meet the minimum constraint, you have to meet. You have to sacrifice other things: the resolution, quantization. Other things that the encoder has under its right, but the I point is you've made a decision that you have to have 60 frames a second, whereas if you just said this is game content, it would take it at the uh, the high, whatever frame rate it was provided at, and not drop it any lower than that. For example, first off, as a gamer, it kind of depends on what game you're playing, right? Yeah. Not not all games are first-person shooters, uh, so it seems to so, me so that let me just try and answer Mo's question here. If we set it at one frame per second as being sort of the indication that that minute was a game, that means when you're just moving your cursor around on top of content, that you're just trying to gesture where content is on a slide or a slide share it, that is not in motion mode, that's in detail mode, because it was specified at one frame per second. Now my mouse is only updating at one frame per second, which is not really cool. So instead you might set it at, well, let's say if it's under 15 frames per second, we assume that it's um, preferring detail instead of motion. But like, you know, lots of stuff's going to be down. You know, you're trying to do some game of the type Yonavar is talking about. It's not a first-person shooter at 4K at 10 frames per second, and you actually prefer motion to detail. I think it's very hard to set, find the threshold at which you switch between those two if you try and use frame rate as the number that drives this parameter. We're trying to define an API that will make sense to web developers, and they're going to expect some they don't set things without expecting something in return. So uh, my concern just for the API, if this is going to be a hint that could be ignored, it, uh, it makes it hard to test. It makes it hard to implement. Um, it makes it hard to understand whether it's working or not. I think it's easy to test it because the definition would be that it gets passed to the codec, not that the codec does exactly X, Y, and Z. For example, if you have a, a hint that says this is music and not spoken word, um, okay, Opus might be able to correctly de uh, figure it out. People make mistakes, for example, if there's background music where there's someone talking. However, uh, uh, if you pass that to instead uh, G711, G711 isn't going to care in the slightest whether it's spoken word or music. What, okay? What if and I so you Sorry, go ahead. Well, I would like to add one point, like as a weekend web developer, uh, I, I would feel that having it as a hint, uh, it's very clear for me that, you know, if, if the, the thing does not behave as I expect, I'm fine with it. But with something as constraint, I would expect it to behave the way I set it. So having something as a hint, as a web developer, I'll be fine if it does not work as, as it's expected. I think that should be okay as long as the spec says, you know, you set the hint, 
uh, the browser might not uh, be able to do the exactly what you need, but it will do it the best it can do. I don't think so. That's a confusing thing for a web developer, at least. So, so what would be the expectation then if you said it wrong? Like, let's say I'm talking and then I break out singing or playing guitar, and uh, the the hint says it's still speech. Is that and and web, a web developer or an or an uh, intentionally or an unintentionally, he can do many things wrong. You know, thing is as long as he said it and and the specification says the hint is something the browser will try, but uh, it it can do its best. It's that's all it you can expect out of it. So we can't expect web developer think to always be addressed, and this fits into that category. So I forget if can the content hint be removed. So we could end up with a situation where it get worse performance when there is a hint than if it had no hint. If you if you if the hints are on the sinks, um, and therefore the application is re responsible for applying the hint, then of course it can be removed. And if we just don't apply it. I mean, an existing spec is it nullable? I forget. It is proposal. Yeah, proposal. You can you can you, you can take it away. You can change it over time, in a current current proposal. And as we discussed, any any solution for this, I would want to see the ability to provide multiple hints, not just a single one. It still seems like an mis API mistake to me. It's action at a distance, uh, formalized in an API. It's keeping the information. So, the, so, so, so I think perhaps we should consider um, Calling the question and moving on. Right. Uh, as to whether or not we want to do something here and hash out the details in the in the in the in the uh, you know requests and 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 on the list and so forth. I would absolutely be in favor of doing something here, and we can. I'm happy to hash out the details as to exactly what that comes out to spec wise. Probably not the current exact PR. Right. I'm supportive of this if it's clear that it's an override. I don't like the way it's currently worded that it seems like the application has to tell the browser about the content. That should not be the case. It should only be if the application knows that it must override browser default behavior, it does this. So calling it something like content override or something like that where it's clear that this is only if you know better than the browser about this content should you set this. I like that. Better. Mm -hmm. I agree with all that. That sounds good. I can easily live with that name. So I think, unless there are objections, I hear at least consensus to something here. And and we can have some proposals as to if alternate proposals as to exactly what to do, such as Mo's, um, and and then f figure out which one we we want, you know, which one and exactly what details we want. That is, any objections to that? So, uh, just a question: Who's going to work on the proposal? Do we have names? Who seems to have an opinion? And I can help some. Does that just mean editing the current issue? <laughs> or more than that? <laughs> I don't care the new issue or the current issue. Yeah, just, just shaping it to the point where we have something very specific that can go into a spec. I can work with Randall to help do that. But one thing separate from this, I'd like to make sure that all the browser vendors are actually planning to optimize the encoding. So whether or not the application provides any override, the browser itself should give the optimal encoder settings 
whether it's screen or camera content. Um, that, that's you know obviously not an API thing, but I just like to make sure that all the browser vendors understand that they need to do that. And I gave what the configuration parameter is in OpenH264. So if Chrome and Firefox can start using that when they do screen share versus camera video, um, that'll help. Browser, there's already, there's already code there is, is very interested in doing that and is doing that to the best of it. It's uh, to the best of its ability and uh, found that it doesn't work for all cases. That's why we need a hint. Yeah, we have. Uh, there is code in there that you know has a concept of this is a screen share versus this is not, and that can ripple through. Uh, part of the, the issue is, for example, when that should be set, uh, and then the other side of it, as you say, is exactly what does that cause in terms of connect parameters, and that can be worked, that could be done too. Uh, certainly, yeah. definitely put on our list to do. Yeah, I think that's more important than this API override. Making sure that the internal APIs uh, are there so that browsers and encoders do the right thing automatically most of the time. I think that's more important than this API. OK, uh, Harold and Stefan, do we need any other decisions relating to this? Or can we move on? Okay, I think we're ready to move on. Okay. All right, uh, so we're gonna try to cover at least some screen capture issues today. We have 11 open issues in screen capture, uh, and we're gonna try to talk about six of them, and we'll see how far we get. Okay, so these are the screen capture issues we have, uh, and let's try to get through at least a few of them. So has Yes, Han. Hi, this is Ohas. Um, I, I, I'm trying to still come up to the speed on the history of why certain decisions were made the way it's made in the current spec. So please bear with me if I'm totally off the tangent in some of these issues. Special, which was opened by Martin, if I remember correctly. This is like we, what happens when an application would go full screen, uh, full screen, for example, if it's a PowerPoint that user selected, or it could be a slide, Google slide uh, tab, and then he goes to the full screen. What should happen? The current behavior is that uh, because the user has selected an application, and when that goes to full screen, that's a totally different window. Um, the receiver side or the screen capture would basically render a black screen, and we wanted to kind of figure out how do we uh, support this behavior in the, uh, uh, uh -huh. the reason it renders a black screen actually has nothing to do with that. It's a bug in uh, Win 10. Okay, so probably I'll correct my understanding on that one. Thanks. So uh, at least from what I uh, understand from this issue from reading the GitHub is that um, we uh, there there are some proposals. Find anything at the API level. All we need to do is that we need to have an inform, informal uh, um, statement that says uh, if, if the browser knows that uh, the PowerPoint that user has selected earlier, when it goes to the full, full screen, if they are related in some way, uh, it's the same window that went uh, into a full screen, uh, we just need to allow, we should let the UA make the decision and we probably, the spec should just say that and nothing more needs to be done for this particular issue. So what do people think about that? Yeah, I mean, the intent sounds clear. I mean, uh, you were capturing a window that now went full screen. The users, are, you know, the, the web developers already said what they wanted, and they probably want to keep capturing. Right. Makes sense to me. Yeah, Bernard, just a question for you. So you're suggesting, too, that, that going forward over time that this, that this would probably work on most operating systems? Like, what, what was that? It, it, well, uh, I think if you selected an application, I mean, the, the issue here is, I believe um, in this particular situation, if you're talking about PowerPoint, there's actually multiple windows, right? So if you're right. selecting right. an application surface, 
you know, there's the question about whether you want to show the window which is showing the slides, or there might be, for example, a notes window. As well. uh, so, I mean, you could select a, a, a particular monitor, um, which would be showing, to, you know, often, yeah, so, I mean, I, I actually, I think it's a little bit more subtle than this. You have to, you might have to choose a monitor. You might have to ch t choose one specific window within an application. I don't think the application surface would that would show you everything, including the notes, which might not necessarily be what you want. I, I think that on a lot of the existing apps today, we found it very difficult to select something um, that didn't show the notes to be able to pick a particular PowerPoint window and right. have that track correctly versus other things. So this may be like it's impossible to actually do exactly what we'd really want. But um, yeah, I agree. So just for clarification, the slide here talks about different modes and stuff. That's not what we're talking about. Is that correct? Yeah, it's not clear to me that any of the modes really do exactly what you want. Yeah, I think the, the slide, the reason why I added the more uh, information here is because um, we have this hierarchy of things where an application might have several windows as they're not pointed out, or, or it can be single window. Uh, in either case, uh, if user has selected a single window, the PowerPoint window, and that goes to full screen, and, and the browser knows both are related to the same application, then then that should be allowed. I think this, this particular issue was very specific to that uh, use case, and hence I kind of listed only those two uh, modes for consideration here. I mean, you're basically trying to explain what will happen, and I think you're right that if you can make an unambiguous determination of the right window, then it's going to work. Right. But otherwise, it might not. And it's more uh, of a no saying exactly well, how this should be done. One thing that I just uh, something that we've run across in the past that I want to be careful about is uh, um, uh, timing of, of changes and so forth. Uh, we've seen issues where um, if you're not careful, um, resizing of windows and other changes like that um, aren't, necess aren't necessarily picked up on instantaneously by things observing them. And that can temporarily cause um, data that's supposed to not be seen to be seen. Uh, so it, so when you start talking about these sort of act actions, you have to be careful. And Randall, would that mean uh, when we, in whatever proposal that we make here, we would also uh, add, add a statement to to that uh, extent, saying that uh, that in this you need to be careful about that, or or, or a, a security consideration section. Yeah, something something like a security. A thing that you have to be careful that that you're guaranteed that the actual change has occurred before you switch what you're capturing and so forth, uh, so you don't accidentally capture the 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 uh, entire user's screen when it hasn't gone actually gone full screen yet or vice or things like that. Makes sense. Uh, can you explain what you mean with mapping failure? Uh, I, I was thinking this is this is a case where. Um, so something I, I would say it's very similar to what uh, Randall was saying, but when when there is a PowerPoint and you try to go full screen and and so, and within a quick second you didn't escape and try to click on some other thing, then then uh, the full screen, uh, the, the actual window and something that was about to go go to full screen would basically do not have a mapping. And what behavior would you kind of want the to, to have then? I would I think you make the decision, and it, it's more more uh, right. like what 
the, the full screen water that went uh, since it was not the one that it was started i would i would stick to water it was earlier and go back to the current current selected one that that's what okay my proposal like we are, we, are, we are making whenever it works it works the right way if if not uh, you you are not too bad of of you know in, in terms of the experience or in in terms of the security uh, point that uh, randall made okay uh, can we move to the next issue? Hey, Yanni Bar. Yes. So um, this issue is about uh, defining behavioral uh, or existing constraints that we uh, define in Media Capture Main uh, and uh, applying them to screen sharing. Uh, I think uh, what's different here is that constraints um, uh, don't necessarily totally mean the same thing in screen sharing, but um, for background, Firefox has supported constraints uh, in the non-spec version of its screen sharing since uh, many years now. And the reason is because downscaling is very critical because a lot of screens are typically very high resolution, very high frame rate, which is too much for uh, WebRTC. So we found users really wanted to be able to use constraints, not to select different sources, but to uh, apply downscaling and decimating of frame rates um, at the track level, uh, because uh, we don't really have any good controls for that on the sync. And um, so there's a separate issue here uh, that's coming up later that talks about bringing back constraints as an argument to get display media, to get display media call. So uh, uh, to separate the issues, this now we're just talking about uh, existing usage, which would be a track you get from uh, screen sharing, you would, we would still have get settings. So you can, uh, you can examine and it would have an apply constraints function being a track that you could change uh, some of these uh, constraints. So, so the two questions are what to support? Uh, should we uh, implicitly uh, support all constraints that are listed under camera capture and meter capture main or should we define them in the spec? And the second one question is whether we should allow cropping or not uh, for screen sharing. Uh, you know, for, for camera Ca capture. There are some cameras that have 16 by 9 modes. Other ones have 4 by 3. And I think most implementations, uh, at least Chrome, uh, we're still working on some cropping. Um, we've come up with that we can't. It makes sense to crop cameras to make 16 by 9, for instance, out of a camera that doesn't have it, just to support um, normalizing um, video output uh, for the six of conferences and stuff. For screen sharing, it probably makes very little sense to crop because you can lose text on the edges, stuff like that. So uh, for what is worth, Firefox implementation, all settings dictionaries in the algorithm have the same aspect, meaning you can you can reduce the size of something, but you cannot change its aspect, uh, regardless of, uh, so if you're sharing like a very portrait window, window that will always be have a portrait window, just smaller. Um, if we don't do cropping, then certain constraints like aspect ratio and resize mode become redundant because everything is always aspect perfect. Uh, it would still make sense perhaps to have, they still would have some informative value, like uh, it might be nice to be able to, from the screen share to read out from get settings the current aspect ratio. Resize mode would probably tell you that if, you know, only if you had the original size would resize mode be none, otherwise it would be downscaled or cropped and downscaled. Um, so my, my current proposal here is that cropping gets complicated and there's low value so that we should not allow cropping. Uh, and, and I also propose that we have an explicit list of constraints that, uh, because I think implementers deserve to know what they need to implement for screen sharing specifically. Um, I think there's a counter argument that if another spec adds like a color uh, constraint or something, it'd be nice if it automatically applied to screen sharing without having to modify the screen sharing spec. I think the opposite. I think it would be nice to not have it apply unless there's specific text about how it should apply. So that's what I'm proposing, explicit list, which would be with height, frame rate, and no cropping. Any questions or thoughts on that? I do have one question, but you can probably it's down in the details about exactly what uh, you know how the frame rate would work and uh, screen share that involves variable frame rate. Uh, 
but I assume it would work basically the same as get user media. Uh, I would assume the same. Um, yes, cameras also have variable frame rates, so I'm also not uh, sure what the answer is there. But it seems like an existing problem, or that could be discussed separately from. And the answer, hopefully, is not to have no constraints at all to that problem. Right. So, are the objections to this general direction? Okay, Yanova. All right, great. So uh, another issue is screen sharing from iframes. Um, the our current get user media spec calls is allow user media. But I think that's going to be usurped by another spec, the feature policy spec, that um, seems to be the way forward to specify permissions for iframes, which I believe is by default, I, uh, camera and microphone are not allowed on iframes unless, sorry, sandboxed iframes, uh, unless, um, Someone correct me if I'm wrong. Unless you specify allow equals camera, allow equals microphone, or allow, and then the question is, should we also have this uh, allowance uh, of screen sharing, whatever it's called, let's say it's screen right now. And the use case for this would be uh, a website that wanted to outsource uh, a customer support um, representative the service into a sandbox service in an iframe where uh, customers could talk to representative over WebRTC and share their screen maybe to fix things. And at the same time, they want that to be in a sandbox iframe so that they have separation from their own servers uh, to this uh, third party service. Um, so the question I think is, do we follow get user media and say disallowed by default, but uh, websites are allowed to turn this on in iframes? Or do we say always disallow screen sharing because it's really dangerous and risky? And there's a link there to a blog uh, about that Bit display media has some concerns when a website, uh, whenever you're sharing an HTML surface, uh, it's an opportunity to write attacks that can uh, circumvent uh, the same origin policy because uh, websites are allowed to handle a lot of URLs and things that they can blast onto screen where they're protect the user is protected because the website cannot itself see what it's putting on your screen and get display media circumvents that. Um, and the, the reasons for having that concern is that uh, there's a difficulty in communing, communicating about iframe origins. And I show a, a sample here from a JS fiddle and it's sharing a screen. And how many people here notice that the origin here asking to see your screen is different from the URL? There's jsfiddle.net is the main page and fiddle.jshell.net is then the one actually want, is the one that actually wants to see your screen. So the concern here with the users aren't really well versed about uh, who's asking for their screen, who they're trusting. Uh, feature policy is based on the idea that the main page delegates trust to its iframes that it allows into its, uh, to be on its page. So in a way, maybe you're trusting the top domain here. However, another use case of iframes is the case of, uh, uh, an example would be JavaScript coding sites like, uh, JavaScript, uh, JS Fiddle, uh, what are the other ones? Code Lab and uh, um, Stack Overflow, these kinds of sites that want to have, they're opening it up to a community to write JavaScript or run applications effectively on their website. And they're kind of saying, we're going to sandbox those. They're not really our problem. You're trusting a third party here. Our hands are, you know, washed clean. And there's a bit of a, a and that seems to not go well with this trust model. Uh, so that I'm a little concerned about allowing this. Um, and I guess wanted to hear what other people think about that. So, so Yonavar, are you suggesting disallow by default, but allow an iframe that had the explicit allow camera microphone screen? Is that, is that your recommendation? Um, I'm actually not sure. I'm on the fence. I believe uh, Martin, is Martin here? I think he had an appointment. Um, so it sounds like he's not here. I think um, at the moment I'm cautious about allowing this. But I guess I would like to hear others' opinions. 
I think from the use case perspective, this is a really good use case to have. And uh, I, I would, um, or, or if the website that I visit and just something like uh, uh, IT support, but it's not from the origin, uh, that, would, that would be a lot to, uh, that would have a screen share, screen share use case. Then, then that the transitive trust would let me share the screen, uh, given given that you know I trust the origin website, website which I started, and and if 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 we can get that trust kind of established, then then for for a user then it it really does not matter if the origin changes because I carried over the trust trust. But if that's not but there's no secure way to establish that uh, you know transitive trust trans transitively then. I, I understand uh, completely actually the, the risk that we have here, and uh, we need to think about it. It's, I would say the question is that can we allow, or it's not about can we allow, should not be allowed, is that how do we ensure that this trust can be maintained so that uh, the user is comfortable to share the screen if, if, if at all he gets to that use case. Yeah, so if Martin's not here, I'd like wait, to wait, wait. go ahead. I was going to say, yeah, yeah. I mean, we it would be good to hear from Martin. Um, I agree before we sign this, but I, and I lean towards very much the we need to do something here to allow this in, in some form, or, or people will just do worse things. Um, but so, I, but I think that the the intermediate thing of of allow making the iframe explicitly, or you know, the iframe grant permission, the the, the disallow by default. Um, I, that that seems like a, a good compromise to make sure that it doesn't happen accidentally and that people are deliberately doing it. You know, that it, it's a deliberate thought out action, not just you went to display an ad and an ad screwed you. Yeah, I I, I pretty much agree. I think we also want to hear from Martin and and discuss elsewhere. This has done a good job of display the, explaining the issues. Uh, the I think this, the 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 biggest question. If we follow what Colin was saying, will be uh, should we give any additional guidance to uh, UAs about how to try to attempt to communicate um, this transfer of trust uh, or trans or or uh, you know or the fact that there's something going on here that's different than the normal case, or whether or not we just don't, simply don't even try to do that, and that's something worth discussing. Um, right. Yeah, I agree. The reason I'm on the fence and not saying we should always disallow is because this problem already exists with camera and microphones. This that who are you trusting? So the I think Martin's point was that the risk is just higher with with screen sharing attacks. Uh, and I don't know if that's yeah. And I agree. And the thing is, if if sites need to do this, like for example the IT support thing, if you block it by default in iframe, then give no way to override it in an iframe, then uh, you constrain the ability to d design your web pages, but more to the point, it'll encourage uh, the uh, people who have that need to um, not iframe stuff that probably should be iframed, you know, you know, and put it directly in their main page right. as third-party JS. So ultimately, it's a, it's a browser permission problem, but it would definitely be good to have guidance. I agree. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. To one more issue, maybe. Okay, this one I believe Martin uh, made a recommendation on, and the use case was to capture from a device and play audio remotely. Um, I think Martin's point was that uh, I guess we should close this bug as won't fix because uh, the proposed solution overrides the user in Oregon preferences and it could be handled with uh, audio playback devices or tab level mute, so uh, no reason to to do this specially. Does that make sense? I think I agree. I agree too. Okay. Okay, so maybe <laughs> so it sounds like we have consensus on this one uh, to close it, and maybe one last one, Yanni North, you can do it in sixty seconds. Okay, I'll try. Yeah, so the original spec on Get Display Media had constraints just like it uses media. Um, re we removed that out of concern to prevent websites from influencing users' uh, source selection, 
because that was believed to be uh, too uh, um, too easy to mount an attack, specifically toward sharing uh, HTML surfaces, like I talked about earlier. But we could have done that with pros instead. We could have said UAs are restricted from using constraints to influence the end user choice of what to share. And more importantly, that would bring back the ergonomics that we're used to from get user media. Um, but it would be important to in the pros to say that uh, while you can add constraints to the get display media function, that uh, will not change what the user is asked to share at all. But it will, however, downscale or decimate frame rates of the end result. And I think that's um, more consistent with gum. And you see the code that I written before and after there, what you have to do uh, previously. Um, today, get display media only allows the value true and false or uh, where the constraints go in get display media. So we'd have to basically get the stream, get the track, and then apply constraints after the fact. Um, I think we should make this change. That is a good idea. This is, I, I don't know what we were thinking back then. I agree. Yeah, it makes no sense to only allow uh, apply constraints after what the difference would it make. All right. That was fast. <laughs> okay. I think we actually have run out of time, though, probably. Um, sorry, to step on. We probably shouldn't push anymore. No, uh, actually, I, I need to go at least. Okay. Anyway, I think that's it. Uh, thank you, everybody, for this meeting. Yep. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.